Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, hydration is key. I fly a lot. Um, Anyway, it's super, super exciting to be here in Moscow. Uh, I travel a lot for my books, fortunately, and this is a really exciting city for me to visit. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, my family, I, the grand, grand, grandparents, uh, everyone's from Russia, which I keep saying. I was excited to come back to the homeland, and then every time I list a city that one of my relatives is from, I find out that's not Russia anymore. So Minsk, no. Pinsk, no. Anyway. Um, so yes, the book is Dinner at the Center of the Earth. I'm old now, so I'll use reading glasses. Um, yeah, I'm going to read to you and talk, and here we go, I guess. How it had come to this, prisoners he felt, had been set so very early. His Jerusalem, his Israel, his end. He'd been given it so long ago, back in suburbia, back in America, a birthright spoon-fed to him in his Jewish day school classroom, a little boy with a heavy prayer book and a yarmulke like a soup bowl turned over and resting atop his head. It is second grade, and they are running the children with their arms outspread. They are flying. The desks are pushed together, the teacher's orders, their lovely 18-year-old teacher who would soon get pregnant and disappear. They know enough, the boys and girls, to love this black-haired lady who's even more black, more beautiful hair, peeks out from under her wig as she pushes the big desk, the teacher's desk, toward theirs. She dresses modestly, but there is no modest when you are a beautiful, raven-haired, 18-year-old second-grade teacher flushed from trying to get pregnant in all your free time. Their love for her was different from what they felt for the others. It was marrying love and wanting to be her love, and it was youthful, energetic teacher love, and they would do anything for her, anything at all. So when after morning prayer, after marching into the room with their big green sedurum and taking their seats, when she'd stood and jutted out her bottom jaw and blown the hair from her eyes, when she'd said up, up, and raised her hands, raising the class so easily with them, prisoner Z's no longer sure if she'd actually spoken the up, up at all. We are going somewhere and we are late, is what she says. Where are we going, asks Bacha, whose English name is Beth. A smile from the teacher, a glimmer to the eye. We are going, my little Yiddelach, to Yerushalayim. We are flying right now to Israel. The Mashiach is coming and we need to get there. We need to help welcome him in. And the hands again are waving and we are all already following. Now push, push the desks together so we can get up into the sky. And when those desks are all together, a circle around the room, the teacher takes one of our tiny chairs, raising her skirt, so we can see her ankle swathed in her scratchy gray tights. She places a foot on the seat of that chair and then climbs onto those child-sized desks. A teacher, a teacher standing on a desk. It is glorious. She bends a bit at the knees and leans her head forward. The teacher then spreads her arms wide. She says, I am on an airplane. I am an airplane. We are all flying to Israel together to make Aliyah. We are headed to Jerusalem. We must hurry, hurry, a long flight, and the Messiah already on his way. And she takes off like that, flying from desk to desk around the room, tilting her beautiful covered arms in the turns. Come, she says, come. You do not want to be left in Gullus, forgotten in this Egypt. When the Messiah comes, our country awaits. And it is Roly Poly Bensi who is first up, and then Mayor Aryeh follows, flashing his monkey grin. There are Devorah and Yocheved, Susan and Zev. And then I am on the chair. Prisoner Z feels himself rising. But with all those arms tilting and everyone running and howling and flying, I'm too afraid to join. And suddenly I am grabbed, and suddenly I am lifted. The teacher has got me, she is holding me, and she sets me down in motion, and that is is love, and that is care. She holds on until my feet are moving and my arms spreading until I too I feel it, until I am looking down at the classroom below, down at New York, at America, until it all looks like desert and all looks like wasteland, nothing but the emptiness that is the whole world outside what God gave us. 
Um, so it's 1996, and I'm uh, moving to Jerusalem to make peace. Peace is breaking out in the Middle East. Uh, Israel already has peace with Egypt. They've got peace with Jordan, a new peace. Uh, the Palestinians have an airport and their own casino in Jericho where the Israelis lose all their money. Uh, things are really looking up, and I'm convinced everybody's going to be holding hands, you know, from Baghdad to Tel Aviv. You know, I've got big plans. Uh, and I'm out in Iowa City, Iowa, uh, finishing my MFA, my writing degree, a master's in fine arts, um, which is a very useful degree. You really don't want to leave town without that diploma. It'll get you far. Uh, point is, but I'm terribly nervous because I'm afraid I'm going to miss it. And it sounds crazy 20 years later, but I'm really telling you, like it was happening so fast and my friends were already there and I literally thought peace is going to start without me. So I get that diploma, uh, I fly home to New York to kiss me mom because I'm a Jewish boy, and then I get on that plane for Tel Aviv. Uh, now uh, I stand before you radically secular, but I grew up really, really religious, kippah, tzitzit, the whole deal. So moving to Israel, there's another thing attached to it. You know, there's the concept of aliyah. You know, the Hebrew root is la'alot. It's to go up, to rise up in holiness, it's a forever thing. You know, the, the way I sum it up is around the same time my buddy was moving to Denver, and he, you know, he just told me I'm moving to Denver. He didn't say, you know, I'm moving to Denver, and I'm going to die in Denver, and the sands of Denver will drink my blood. You know, he's like, I'm at Ikea. We'll see how the job goes. But for me, forever. Uh, so I get on that plane, you know, take the night flight. I wake up in Tel Aviv. It's the old airport. You could still get off the airplane and kiss the ground. And I go into the building and I look for the first official looking Jew that I can find. And I ask him, I say, where is the office for new immigrants? And he says to me, did you come on the plane from Manhattan? You know, not America, not New York, Manhattan, like we have our own fucking airstrip running down Broadway. Uh, and I said to him, yes, I did. And he says to me, it's not too late, go back. <laughs> but uh, I don't go back, I get settled in, and I've spent time in Jerusalem before, I'm hooked up, and a couple of days later, I'm in the you know, German colony and the, one of the old stone Arab houses filled with Israeli academics and you know, the thinkers, that kind of German colony crowd. One of the architects of the Oslo Accords is at dinner. And my hostess, she raises a glass of wine, and I understand it's to welcome me. You know, this is my welcome dinner. And I also understand, you know, I'm the missing cog that peace needs. You know, th the one missing thing was a completely unpublished, long-haired and mildly stoned uh, fiction writer. But uh, she raises her cup, and she says, welcome to the Titanic. Um, and I understand. I'm telling you, I get where all this negativity is coming from. I read the papers. I follow along to the story. The prime minister has been assassinated. Buses are blowing up. It is a dark time. But I'm really, I'm, I'm here before you to like testify to this. It felt so good on the streets. You know, we'd spend Shabbat afternoon, we'd go to Arab East Jerusalem to the Palestinian restaurants, and I just couldn't believe in my lifetime, I'd see literally one of like the enemies of Israel, like one of the big wigs of the PLO, of the Palestinian Liberation Authority, just sitting there, you know, having lunch, and one of the big wig Israeli journalists from the nightly news sitting at the next table, and all the kids, Jewish and Palestinian, Israeli and Palestinian, running around together, and I thought, it's really happening. You know, I'm really here. But it's Israeli-Palestinian peace, not Israeli-Palestinian, American, British, Russian peace, all that. So I don't want to live in the American bubble. I don't want to live a Yankee life. You know, I want to be part of it. So I move to a neighborhood, Nachlaot, in the heart of the heart of the city. And I move into this crazy tumble-down apartment with my buddy Joel. You know, it's patched with tin and chicken wire. And when it rains, you can see the rain like running off the light bulb and running down the walls and running under the doors. I'm still thrilled that my mother never saw that apartment. 
Uh, and it was just like this crazy neighborhood of, you know, messianists and born-agains and old Bukharian women, you know, everyone living together, you know, all of us with dreams. I was going to be a fiction writer, you know, that was my dream. And my buddy, I remember him, you know, he was going to be a rapper. And I didn't have to invent fiction, but in Jerusalem then, he literally had to invent Hebrew rap, basically. It was not a thing. But uh, by the way, it's Adag Nachal. He's really like a famous Israeli rapper now. He did it um, in that crazy little neighborhood. And maybe what sums up the craziest of the neighborhood best is not my story. It's a buddy's story. He was in a very loving relationship, very loyal. And he wakes up one morning, you know, with his girlfriend. Uh, and he goes to pee, and he has a terrible venereal disease. I mean, his eyes are on fire, his penis is on fire, his teeth are chattering, his fingernails are curling. Something is horribly wrong with him. There's one uh, non-medical side effect, which is uh, uh, when he uh, sits down, when he poops, he's fine. You know, peas, the fire in the eyes, the tongue, the like fingers, teeth chattering, fire through his body, poops and peas, fine. It goes on like that. Stand, poops and peas, Electric, we can't figure out, and finally, uh, we diagnose what's wrong with my friend, and it's less medical and more mechanical. It's an engineering issue. Uh, his landlord has not grounded the electricity, and when he's sitting, he's facing porcelain, and when he's standing up, he's closing the electric circuit and being electrocuted uh, through his very manhood. Uh, the point is, this kind of madness, these kind of side effects, this kind of craziness was the story of our neighborhood. We had these headaches all day long, you know, I have a friend here who lived in Nachlaut. I can't tell you what a special and crazy and insane neighborhood this is. And one other thing I loved about Nachlaut, if any of you have been to Jerusalem, it's really close to the shuk, to the open air vegetable and food market. And this wasn't because I was a bachelor then that I had an empty fridge. It was just so Jerusalem. Like, I loved every day. If I needed a tomato, I would get up, I'd walk to the market, I'd buy a tomato, I'd come home. I need a cucumber. I'd walk back to the market, get a cucumber, walk home. I mean, uh, I think about my nut man. He must have lost money on me. I'd literally buy pistachios one at a time just to have the trip. Um, it was just such a joyous part of my life. And uh, one Friday afternoon, I'm making the trip to the Shuk, Erev Shabbat, where everyone does their big weekly shopping. It's a madhouse. And I'm there with uh, my Israeli girlfriend, and my buddy Mike is down from Haifa, and we're doing our shopping, and we get, you know, the chalot, and the hummus, and the pita, and you go to marzipan for your ragalach, you know, we get the usuals. And as we do also usually every Friday, we say, should we do a big shopping? And then it's always a beautiful day in Jerusalem, the weather's always perfect, and we say, forget about it, let's just go home. So we walk the couple of blocks home, and we get out to the balcony and sit down to set up. And as we, you know, start ripping into things and settle down, we hear a boom and another low boom because the market has just blown up. Now, I'm a Long Island boy and a straight up coward. You know, I want to freak out. I want to do the whole, you know, we were just there. We, you know, we almost died. We could have been killed. I really want to panic. But uh, we're working a lot on gender issues in the States and ideas of masculinity and femininity. This is Israel 20 years ago. My Israeli girlfriend, you know, she's already uh, more of a man than I am, but she wants to make a man out of me. You know, we're not going to panic. We're not going to lose our minds. She says to me, when your number's up, your number's up. That's it. That's how they do it in Israel. You know, you didn't survive September 11th, you know, in Minnesota, and you didn't survive it, you know, in Upper Manhattan or the Bronx. In Jerusalem, if you're close enough to claim a tragedy, you're dead. Otherwise, go get the dry cleaning, pick the kids up from school, keep going. And she convinces me. I actually, I'm not afraid, and I kind of know why that is now from a distance. It's because we were building something, we were making peace. You know, and this is not about me moving to Israel to be a paratrooper or to fight wars or anything. This is me being like a peacenik. I just, I just thought it takes so many good people to build good things and we're all building this peace together. You know, there's only two sides to this story, pro-peace and against peace. You know, those are the sides. And I was on team peace and I thought, if some of us die, if the enemies of peace are blowing stuff up to make us give up on this dream, I was ready to die for that then. I really was, and I just 
wasn't afraid. So we go on with our lives. And the other part of my day was I was at the end of, you know, Betzal, at the end of the hill. I would just walk up and down Ben Yehuda Street to Zion Square, the very, you know, central square where there is a coffee shop where I wrote uh, my first book. You know, and uh, I was so broke then, by the way, I love David, the owner. A lot of writers have bar tabs. There's a lot of heavy drinking writers, as we all know. I had a coffee tab. I would, I would drink, you know, on my tab there, and when I sold a story, I would pay off my coffee debt. Uh, so I walk up the block, I walk down the block, and I do my writing for the day, and I'm ready to go home, and I'm ready to pack up, and I think, just put in another two minutes, five minutes. It's the same as going to the gym. It's the same thing with writing. You can always dig a little bit deeper. You know what I'm saying? One more push up, one more minute on the bike. It's the same thing with writing. Like add a word, add a sentence. If your dream is to be a writer, you know, you just have to put in those extra few minutes every day. That's the difference between like keeping an edge. So I finish up my work and I pack up my things to walk up the block to go home. And then I hear a boom. But this time, I've heard that noise before. And when I hear the second blast and the third, it is the worst sound that I've ever heard in my whole life because I know that I'm listening to people get dead. And the smoke is you know, coming towards us and everybody's running our way. And I just turned you know, animal. It's like you're erased. I, I couldn't remember my phone number to call home to my mom or my girlfriend in the Jewish boy order and, you know, tell them that I'm alive. I, 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 you're pulled like a moth to the fire. You want to run out there, but it's Israel. There's nothing for you to do if you're not there or not expert. You know, the police, the paratroopers, everybody's already descending. The paramedics in minutes, you know, everybody's already on the scene. So we just sort of try and figure out who left, who's still there, you know, is everyone we think was just alive still alive? And then, you know, I go home. I walk up to that corner, to the block I take home every day, and I make maybe my first non-Israeli decision of that whole period. You know, I think about my future self, the person standing before you now, and I think, what good are these memories going to do me 20 years later? You know, what good is it for me to see the bodies and the body parts and the blood running down that street? Who is that going to help? So I take a deep breath and I walk around the block, you know, and I walk parallel one street over to home. But the next day, I'm right back out there right in the blast zone, which it's Israel, it's all cleaned up, the tables are out, I'm eating a good, uh, you know, American-style slice of New York, you know, trying to be New York pizza. You know, Joel has dragged me out there, and it looks the same as the day before, except maybe I remember the window and the cash machine was still out, but things are patched, things are polished. It's as it was the day before. And the reason I'm out there, the reason Joel has dragged me out there, it's not about politics, and it's not about greater Israel or any of the things, you know, occupation, right wing, left wing, all the stuff that comes up in question and answer. The reason I'm out there is because if you don't go back the next day after what happened the day before, you're not going to go back the day after that and the day after that. It's just about continuity. It's just about continuing on. But I'm starting to get the idea that maybe acting normal isn't so normal. You know, and uh, uh, it's surely fun. It's a bookish crowd here, and I'm in Moscow. But it makes me think of I uh, really changed my life. I love Chekhov's Ward 6. I love that, you know, I guess it's, it's a long, short story novella. But I love this notion of, like, you know, sometimes proving crazy is not crazy is kind of a difficult thing. And I'm thinking maybe this whole national idea of acting normal really isn't as normal as it sounds. I'm thinking maybe after a day like that, we should have a national panic day. I'm thinking we should all curl up in a fetal position, you know, get on the floor, and maybe we should shake and cry and panic for a little while and totally freak out. That's what I'm thinking about. But then I grab on to that larger idea of peace. You know, I think about what we're building, and I think about how possible the impossible needs to be sometimes. And what I grab onto is the moon. 
you know? Since the dawn of time, people have looked up at the moon and for some stupid and wonderful reason, everybody's wanted to touch it. You know, we wanted to get to the moon. And I think about what a great fight. I would love, can we have another, I come to you from America. Can we have another fight like that again? What a great battle to have America versus Russia. Who can touch the moon first? Doesn't hurt a soul, you know? And I think with less computing power than anybody has in their iPhones or their Androids or your watches or your AirPods, any of those devices using, I still, my father was an engineer. I have his slide rule still. You know, with slide rules and graph paper, we literally sent a man to the moon. It's absolutely impossible. And back to not understanding engineering, I get the part even of sending someone to the moon. I can sort of get the slingshot idea. It's the bringing him back that I don't get. We sent people there and then we brought them home. You know, I thought that is literally impossible, but we set our minds to it, you know, and we did it. So how hard can peace be, you know? And especially at that time, you know, come back to me. It's like, it's, it's on the edge of a new millennium. You know, America is really involved in this process. We have President Bill Clinton who is liked all around the world. We have a surplus. We've got money to burn then as a country. We had plenty of cash. There was all this good forces from around the world. You know, so many countries trying to be a part of this. And we were one signature away. You know, you can unroll the maps now in some archive. Probably everybody knows exactly what's going to be traded, exactly what those two countries look like. One more signature. And I have to say at that time also, it was the edge of the new millennium. It was almost the year 2000. And that round number business, for whatever reason, with human beings, it makes us nutty with joy, those big numbers. We really felt, me and my friends, 2000, that's our year. And Jerusalem, fun fact, you know what I'm saying? 2000 was exciting all over the world, but you know, Jesus used to be our neighbor. It was like our hometown guy's birthday, you know, that idea. 2000 is coming. And also, right around then, it was Jewish New Year, it was Rosh Hashanah, and we're like, I felt the double New Year thing, you know, the Christian 2000 and the Jewish New Year beginning, and we thought, this is our time. Like, this is the year we're going to get peace. And I throw a dinner for my friends, a, a New Year's dinner, and I invite everybody up, you know, to eat, and back to the, uh, the bachelor part of the story about the empty fridge, it was potluck. You bring your own food, I'll clean up. But nonetheless, I hosted. Anyway, uh, all my friends come over and we have this great dinner and it's really joyous and we're out on the balcony and everybody's smoking and drinking and we thought like, this is really the time. It's upon us. And everybody goes home, we go to sleep and I wake up in the morning and the country is on fire. Intifada 2 has broken out and it is more violent and more bloody and more dangerous than anything I've seen before. There's a completely different feel. What it feels like is mutually assured self-destruction. You know, like it took all these people around the world and all these people in Israel and Palestine and everyone to build this peace. And it's going to take maybe like a dozen guys on each side to burn the whole fucking thing to the ground. And it's just, you know, it's an out of control feeling. And I call my friend Debbie uh, to talk and she's at work. Uh, and she answers her phone uh, and her job is, she's a war photographer, still is. So being at work, I hear the gunfire and the tear gas and the sounds of a battle. She's, you know, in the middle of a firefight there taking pictures. And I say to her, um, Debbie, at dinner last night, do you think Shelly had a good time? And she still teases me about this call, you know, really makes fun of me. But this notion, uh, I'm a neurotic and I've hosted a dinner party. And if the whole rule in Jerusalem is we're going to continue on as normal, then I need some information. So she dropped behind one of those big stone things, you know, the big giant uh, cement blocks you see on the news. And we just went through dinner, you know. Do you think... Uh, Dessert was okay. Is it fine that Kathy and Kobe drove from Tel Aviv? We just, you know, continued through till I felt better. And then we went on like that with our life. You know, just that was our new day to day. And in an already militarized city, in this already, you know, very army, you know, 
armament heavy place, it looks even more militaristic than before. You know, there's now guns on every corner. There's machine guns everywhere you go. And a, a lesson that I'll never forget, as, you know, as quickly as it looks like war breaks out, they are slowly and carefully installed. I remember the flatbed trucks going by with the tanks on them getting delivered to a front line that's, you know, a mile and a half from my front door. But that's just my life then, you know? If you're writing your novel and your windows are shaking from tank fire, you just put in your earplugs and you keep typing. You know, I remember watching Die Hard, and I remember pausing the movie, you know, the Bruce Willis movie in my living room, because I was like, I couldn't tell where the machine gun fire was coming from, and I opened the doors, and it's, you know, bouncing off the hills. It's my own Jerusalem sound, uh, surround sound to back up what's coming through the TV. And this just becomes our day-to-day. -day. And I'm, you know, flying around the world at this time, and you know, I'm already a fiction writer, and I'm traveling constantly, and I can't even tell you how excited. If I have an empty middle seat when I go home from Moscow, I will be thrilled. But I am flying back to Israel on empty planes. You know, there's nothing more depressing, because nobody in the world wants to come to my country, and nobody in my country wants to come to my city and nobody in the city wants to come to my neighborhood because Nachlaot keeps blowing up. But one big change for me during that period is I've become afraid. All that time of being, you know, not afraid of believing in peace, all that stuff that held me together is now gone. Because at this point I understand that Arafat sucks and Sharon sucks and nobody's trying, nobody's gonna make this peace that still isn't made, you know, 20 years later. So I am really afraid, and I am looking for something to grab onto, something to keep me sane and to anchor me and to give me hope during this time. You know, I'm looking for a new man on the moon to ground me at this period, and what I start doing is heading up to Mount Scopus every day. I start going to Hebrew University, because to me, that still symbolizes the peace. That's the future. You know, a campus isn't, you know, like Muslim or Jew or, you know, uh, right or left or religious or secular. Everything breaks up. People sit by subject, you know, and no one at a university is ever working on the now. Everyone there is working towards the future. There's no reason to be there if you don't have a dream set somewhere ahead in time. You know, everyone's either learning or trying to have sex, and to me that literally is just a perfect utopian place. So in my darkest days in Jerusalem, it was, you know, to Hebrew you that I headed. Z tells her about those sweet and pure years in Jerusalem, the peace process years. He tells the waitress how wonderful it felt to live there, even with the terror that darkened so many days. He shares with her his memories of what it was like to be the new immigrant, what it meant for him to make do while he was broke and alone and yet always exhilarated by that ancient city. He was so busy then becoming fluent in Hebrew, getting himself educated, and embarking on a career that quickly turned into a secret other. When he had his Hebrew to study and his schoolwork to do, he would always take the bus up the mountain even if his classes had been down on Givat Ram. He'd hop off at the last stop and file past security, pausing for inspection by one of the old men, and they were always old, whose investigations consisted of pressing their fingers to the bottom of his book bag as if checking to see if it was ripe. Z would settle into the library's fourth floor, feeling himself cocooned in a vision of Israel's brightest possible future. That's what he was trying to express to the waitress, how for him, for his dreams of what Israel might become, Mount Scopus summed it up. Crammed together at those study tables were religious and secular, Arab and Jew, rich and poor, white and brown, and sometimes black. The social groupings based on subject and course. The focus of the students, as with all universities the universe over, resting on the twin pillars 
of learning and getting laid. That campus was a place of sex and study, a refuge from the attendant politics and attendant hatreds that constantly rattled the state. It was as if all that noise was filtered out and what was left was just pure hope. They were up on that mountain waiting for the inevitable harmony to set in, a promise change that had literally drawn Z from America. He had moved to Israel to contribute to that happy age. He'd rushed his aliyah, transferring to Hebrew University in the middle of his graduate degree because he was afraid if he stayed in America any longer, he'd miss it. He was afraid peace would start without him. Z admits in response to the waitress's question that of course there were the junior politicians in student government and the junior idiots and crackpots on campus who would one day likewise see their professional idiocies and crackpotitudes blossom. But the overarching dominant goodness and happy idealism of the place easily drowned them out. Nothing better demonstrated the unique normality of that oasis than the unstated policy that one could leave one's bag on a table and, for a few moments, walk away. Really, outside the university, Z could think of no other place in the whole country where a bag left unattended wouldn't have the first person to spot it yelling out without hesitation, the bomb squad summoned, a cordon immediately thrown. So often and frequently did this happen that whenever anyone was late to dinner or a drink, all they'd need say was, suspicious object, everyone's permanent, eternally reusable excuse. Z always remembers the face of a businessman running back to fetch his forgotten briefcase, just in time to see the sapper set it off, all his papers swirling down onto the sidewalk after being blasted into the air. But on campus, no one expected you to drag all your books from your favorite carol to run out for a coffee or a smoke or a quick pee. When Z was hungry, which in those days, in his slightly younger man's body, he always ravenously was, he'd run through the absurdly Byzantine main building and make his way across the donor named Nancy Reagan Plaza to the Frank Sinatra cafeteria which served, as far as he was concerned, the best schnitzel in town. Every school day for countless school days, he ate the same thing, a colossal, state-subsidized plate of schnitzel, rice, and gravy, a meal served to him by a kitchen staff that was a mix of Israelis from West Jerusalem and Palestinians from the neighboring village. Z felt warmly toward all of them. It was the kind of fondness fostered by loyalty and routine and the nurturing inherent in being cared for. Answering another question from the waitress, one punctuated by a guffaw, Z admits that yes, he falls easily in love with anyone who feeds him, and that when he finds a lunch he likes, he does indeed eat it every day. He also admits that he is telling the story this way because he really wants her to grasp how important and special that place was to him and how singular its character, because he wants her to understand how perfectly, evilly perfect it was to blow it up. I'll stop there, thanks so much. Thank you.